In this session, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, appliance energy use. We're going to talk about looking at and assessing lighting. We're also going to look at home electronics and how they use energy. And then we're going to kind of come back around and just review what we learned. All of this is important because these appliances go on which load? Okay, it goes on our electric load, right? Okay, so when we have a particularly high electric bill or we're trying to reduce the electric side of our utility bill, these are the kinds of things we're going to go be looking at and looking at how do we, how do we assess the electrical load, how do we reduce the electrical load, and so on. So this is, this is where we want to look. But to do that, we got to kind of figure out what's going on with the electrical load. And so we need some diagnostic equipment. We have watt meters, okay? The plug-in watt meters like kilowatt and a watts up. What these devices do is you plug in your electrical load into one of these devices and it will tell you what the device is using in energy right now. And as longer you leave them plugged in, the more information that you get. Remember when we were talking about our procedure for doing an audit, we talked about plugging in the refrigerator to one of these watt meters, right? And it monitors the refrigerator over time and gives us data to use. We can do that with any appliance, any electrical appliance. We can plug it into one of these watt meters. We also have a circuit meter. What the circuit meter does is it measures voltage drop. Why is it important to measure voltage drop? If we plug in a circuit meter and it's showing a 10, 15% voltage drop, what does that tell us about that outlet? So it tells us we have an issue. Now the reason why this is important is that if we're doing we're, we're going to, to do a measure th that is blowing insulation into a wall, for example, okay? And we have, a, we have voltage drop on the outlets on that wall. That means that there may be a problem with the wiring, that there's definitely a problem going on there. And if we have wires that are loose, then when we blow that insulation into that wall, we run the risk of ripping those wires out of those outlets. So if we are seeing voltage drop, then we're gonna call an electrician and have the electrician come out and troubleshoot the problem. The last thing we see is, you see this big, looks like a power strip. And, and basically it is a power strip, but it's a power strip with one of these watt meters built into it. So that watt meter as, can monitor each individual outlet. So this is something great to have if you're, say, uh, you have a stack of electronics, for example. So that's how we do diagnostics. Now, when it comes to appliances, refrigerators in particular, we have some other tools. We can actually go and look at the appliance label, pull the model number and serial number, and sometimes even the manufacturing date and go to either the DIY website or to the Energy Star website and look up this refrigerator and its average energy use. And, and then with that information, we can actually figure out whether or not we can replace this refrigerator or this freezer with an Energy Star model and save money for the homeowner. And I told you the story about the, the homeowner with the 15-year-old refrigerator, they don't make them like this anymore. Mm -hmm. You remember that story? Yes. So when it comes to refrigerators, let's look at some of the things that affect the efficiency of a refrigerator. Okay. First off, one of the things that affect the efficiency of a refrigerator is, of course, the insulation. Because the job of the insulation is to keep the cold in, right? The job of insulation is to keep the heat out, right? So we have this compressor and this system inside our refrigerator, and what do we do? We're removing heat from inside the refrigerator and depositing it outside the refrigerator. 
on the outside of the refrigerator, and then we have insulation to keep that heat from getting back in the refrigerator. That's what the insulation is for. We also have weather stripping. And we have weather stripping there to keep the cool air in and keep the warm air out, right? So we don't have any air leakage going on in our refrigerator. So what condition is that weather stripping in? If the weather stripping doesn't seal well, if it's got cracks in it, and so on, then we're going to have some air leakage in our refrigerator, our freezer controls. What are the controls set at? Let's spend a little bit of time talking about controls. What should a refrigerator be set at? Now, think about your refrigerator at home. What, is, what are the controls? What do the controls look like? Is it a dial? Is it a slide? Okay, and it says something like cold to coldest or one to nine. What is that? Oh, I set my refrigerator at five. Well, mine's at two. What does that mean? What does that even mean? It means nothing. <laughs> it really doesn't. The temperature in our refrigerator should be between 38 and 40 degrees. Why? Why 38? If we go to 36, 34, things tend to freeze. Anybody had lettuce that's been frozen and then thawed? Wow, that's good stuff, isn't it? Oh, salads. <laughs> salads. Salads made out of frozen lettuce? Yeah. Okay. It's just it's not, much, not much nastier on, on earth than frozen lettuce, right? Okay. Interestingly enough, though, where's the coldest part of your refrigerator? At the bottom? Where you put your fruits and vegetables and... Okay, we need to start a petition to have our refrigerators redesigned, right? Okay, but why 40 degrees? Why not 41, 42? Where bacteria, uh, after 40 degrees, bacteria starts to grow in your food. That's right. So above 40 degrees, we start to get into the danger zone where bacteria begins to grow in our food, which is why we have a refrigerator to begin with. So we know where we're supposed to be. Our controls don't help us. So what we do, and this is what I'd recommend, and you can recommend this to your homeowners. Grab yourself two of those magnetic thermometers. They're cheap, buck fifty or something like that, and they've got some numbers on them. You put one thermometer at the top of the refrigerator and one at the bottom. The thermometer at the bottom should read no less than 38 degrees. The one at the top should read no more than 40. <coughs> now you have real information you can operate on. We know it's supposed to be between 38 and 40, but unless we have a way to, f to know where we're at, then we're just guessing, right? Let's talk about the freezer for, for a moment. We talked about the temperature on the refrigerator. Now let's talk about the temperature's range on the freezer. If we look at the slide, we see the temperature range for our freezer should between, be between zero and five degrees Fahrenheit. Why zero and five? Below zero degrees, we're just wasting energy, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to stay frozen. Above five degrees, things begin to thaw. So coils, how is it that coils affect the efficiency of a refrigerator freezer? Okay, they're exchanging the heat. So what would reduce the quality or the efficiency of a refrigerator? Dirty coils. Dirty coils, okay? Because those coils are giving off the heat. Okay, they pulled the heat from inside the refrigerator and now they're giving it off. If, we, if that's caked with dirt and dust and mud, it's going to affect its ability to give off that heat. Air circulation around the coils, that will also affect their ability to give off heat. Motors, how do motors affect the efficiency of an appliance like a refrigerator or a freezer? Dirty motors, they don't run as efficiently, right? As they get older, they require more power to run them. The quality of the motor to begin with, right? If you had a high efficiency motor to begin with, it's going to be more efficient 
than a lower quality motor which doesn't have as many turns in the, uh, in the coils. Okay, so those things affect our efficiency for our refrigerator. We can do the same thing in the freezer that we're doing in the refrigerator. We can get those sticky magnets, magnetic magnets, pop them in top of the freezer, bottom of the freezer, and we monitor the temperature. And then we can make sure that our food stays in a safe zone without us wasting any energy. Uh, one other question. Have you guys seen this energy saver switch in your refrigerator? We know that when moist air gets next to a cold surface, what happens? Condensation. And when you have condensation, moisture, and food, we get bacterial, mold, those sorts of things. Right. Well, your refrigerator is inherently cold, right? That's the point. But the weak spot of your refrigerator is the weather stripping. So refrigerator manufacturers came up with this concept. They're like, you know, in high humidity climates, that weather stripping actually grows mold because it's cold and we have condensation and all that good and all that stuff, right? So they came up with this idea. You know what? Why don't we put a heater in the weather stripping to keep the weather stripping warm? so that we don't have condensation and mold problems. <laughs> Isn't that a great idea? Yeah. yeah, let's build a box that cools stuff and then stick a heater in it. Yeah. The energy saver switch turns off the heater in your weather stripping on your refrigerator. That's what the energy saver switch does. So if you live in a dry climate like Denver or someplace like that, Arizona, those kinds of places, Turning that energy saver switch on to turn the heater off is a good thing. If you leave, live in Louisiana, Florida, someplace that has high humidity, then you want to leave that energy saver switch off so that the heater runs. Oh, by the way, that's the way your frost-free refrigerators work, right? Every 20 minutes or so, they run a heater okay, to defrost the coils. So you, you run a heater in the middle of your refrigerator? Okay. Yep, there's energy efficiency for you. Okay. Let's look at a couple of pictures of bad weather stripping. Okay. When you look at a homeowner's refrigerator, you're looking for things like this. Cracks, places where the weather stripping doesn't um, seal well, places where you see microbial contamination. This one and this picture in the lower left-hand corner of this slide, you can see... Um, we got a little bit of mold growing there. It's possible that this particular customer is in a high humid area and they have their energy switch turned on, energy saver switch turned on. First thing you recommend is to, for them to shut that off and to bleach that real good. Let's talk about dishwashers, dishwasher efficiency. So what are some factors that contribute to the efficiency of a dishwasher? How much water it uses? Whether or not the, the homeowner is using an air dry or they're using their um, heater to dry the dishes. Why don't we simply shut off the heat dry and use air dry? How full it is. Because it's going to run through a full cycle no matter what. So if we put one cup in there and run the whole, run it through a whole cycle, it's going to run through a whole cycle for that one cup. So if we fill up the dishwasher, then we're, we're going to get more um, dishes washed per cycle, right? That makes sense. Are we running peak time or not? So, you know, we might ask ourselves this question. Would it work for you or for your homeowner to put all your dinner dishes into the dishwasher and then right before you go to bed, kick off the dishwasher so it runs at night off peak. Yeah. Then we have it on air dry, so it only runs for, say, 90 minutes or something like that. And then it has the rest of the night to air dry. The next morning when we get up to start making our breakfast, we now can pull near dry dishes out of our dishwasher for breakfast. 
and we save a bunch of money. We've run our dishwasher full. We've run it off peak. We've turned our air, our heat dry feature off. All of those things. But understand this. The peak electrical use, most people think it's during the day, right? Businesses, you're using lots of energy. That's where the peak hours are. That's not the peak hours. The peak hours are between 7 and 9 o'clock at night. 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. When everybody's at home, they're cooking, they're watching TV, they're running their computers, everything is on at night. Let's talk about washing machines, washing clothes. When we wash clothes, we have what's called an EF, which is called the energy factor. The energy factor is the cubic feet of clothes that can be washed per kilowatt hour. Now, the big rage, the new rage is front load washing machines. What is so great about front load washing machines? They use less water, okay, what else? They use less energy. They use less energy, really. How do they manage to use less energy? Front load washing machines spin, they have a really, really high speed spin cycle. That high speed spin cycle extracts more water out of the clothes before it's done. Which means that when those clothes go into the dryer, Mark, yeah, they're, twice as dry. they're drier than before, okay? Now, this is what's interesting about that. When we talk about a front load washing machine using less energy, most of the energy that a front load washing machine saves isn't in the washing machine, it's in the dryer. That's where we have what's called the modified energy factor, MEF. MEF, modified energy factor, is the cubic feet of clothes that can be both washed and dried per kilowatt hour, okay? Modified energy factor. So when you go from a regular top load tub style washing machine to a front load washing machine, the EF, it's a little bit different, but not huge. But the MEF, the MEF is huge in the difference. And then, and then water, right? We talked about saving water. You, you know, how does, how does a front load washing machine go about saving water? Well, yeah, of course, we use it less, but I mean, how, what is the mechanics of it? What's the process of actually cleaning clothes? I mean, how do we get clothes clean? We clean clothes by forcing water through the material. That's what we're trying to do. We force the water through the material. Okay? So a front load washing machine takes the clothes, just like Angela said, dunks them in the water, takes them out. Dunks them in the water, takes them out. Plus, with cold, with detergents that are now designed to be used in cold water, we don't have to heat the water as much to get clean clothes. So we can do a lot more washing in cold and warm than we did before. Let's talk about dryers. When it comes to drying clothes, the most efficient dryer is of course a clothesline or a clothes rack, right? Because because that doesn't require energy, any, any energy at all. The next most efficient clothes dryer is actually an Energy Star washing machine. Why would we say that a most efficient dryer? Because of the spin factor that we talked about, right? A energy efficient or an Energy Star washing machine is gonna make any dryer, any dryer at all, more efficient. So even if your homeowner replaced their washing machine with an Energy Star washing machine and didn't do anything with their 15, 20, 25 year old dryer, they'd be better off, okay? But if they're gonna replace the dryer, they'd wanna replace the dryer with a new gas dryer. And that's simply because it's cheaper in this area to heat with gas than it is with electricity. Old gas dryer, New Energy Star electric dryer, and then at the bottom of the list is an old electric dryer. But you can always get energy savings by replacing the washing machine with a front load Energy Star rated washing machine. 
without even doing anything with the dryer. Let's talk about dryer venting. This is one of my pet peeves. Absolutely a pet peeve of mine, okay? Anybody in this room have vinyl vent hose on their dryer right now? If you don't know for sure, go home and check. If you've got vinyl this weekend, go to the hardware store and get yourself a metal hose. Not a metalized hose, a metal hose, right? And when I say metal hose, I'm talking about one of these that's actually made out of metal, metal flex, or hard pipe. Now, hard pipe is best, but hard pipe is really a pain, okay? Because it'll come loose very easily, and if you have to move the dryer for any reason, it's disconnected, right? So I'm not talking about metalized vinyl like this talking about an actual metal hose, like it's in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide. Now, why, do, why am I all down on vinyl? What's that? Okay, it's all about fire protection, right? When you have that, I mean, that's the two things, right? We have vinyl, and then we have that constricting that happens in that hose. So now we start to grab lint. And as the lint begins to build up, lint is flammable, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is when lint catches fire and vinyl heats up, what happens? Fire. The vinyl melts, melts right out. and the fire spreads, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why we want to go with the metal because metal has, of course, metal will melt but it has a much higher melting point. The hard pipe we like because the hard pipe doesn't have any ridges at all to catch lint. So there's a couple of things you want to make sure that you do. Replace any vinyl or metalized vinyl with a metal pipe and check it regularly to make sure that it's clear and clean. And this is especially true, especially true if you have a gas dryer or that your client, your homeowner has a gas dryer. Why is it especially important that we have a metal dryer vent when we have a gas dryer? When you have a gas dryer, that vent is also your flue pipe. Okay? So we don't just blow the warm air the warm air out of your dryer through that pipe. We also blow the hot air of your, your flu, your exhaust gases that you burn also goes through that same pipe. So, so the temperature is v a lot higher for a gas dryer through your vent than it is with an electric. So we have a higher potential for carbon monoxide, higher potential for, melting. Higher potential for melting, higher potential for fire because the air moving through there is higher is hotter anyway no. just to begin with the humidity also goes through but we're really primarily concerned about fire right that that air is very very hot consequently it will hold lots and lots of moisture before condensation begins right so you're going to have lint and that lint's going to be dry so let's talk a little bit about gas ranges you know, gas rangers are one of those things where, you know, Energy Star has pretty much been exclusively they, electric, looking at electrical appliances. They are just now starting to look at gas appliances. But when it comes to things like gas rangers and gas ovens, they just are what they are. Gas, like we talked about, it's cheaper to heat with gas than it is with electric. So a, a gas range is gonna be cheaper to run than an electric range. But then again, it all depends on how much you use it. If you're using it every day, you have for several hours, it's gonna be a lot cheaper. If you use it once or twice a week, once or twice a month, because you eat out all the time, it's not nearly the big deal. Um, other things to watch out for are uncoated brass fuel lines. You seen those? 
Hopefully not. Uncoated. Uncoated. What do I mean by uncoated? Just looks like brass, right? Okay, yep. usually when we see our fuel lines, they've got, they're yellow. Okay, yep. that's the common. So they've got a coating over the top of them, <coughs> right? That makes them non-conductive. One more thing on gas ranges. Remember we talked about when we did our audit walkthrough, we talked about doing a fuel switch for our range or oven. Do you remember that? We talked about that. But, but we only would do that if we, if we had proper venting, right? Venting to the outside. Okay. I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you another story. Okay. So gas ovens are notorious for generating dangerous levels of CO. Have I told you this story? Okay. Notorious for, cre cre for generating dangerous amounts of CO, gas ovens. Okay. So I'm in a house, uh, downtown area, and the setup, actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm in a different house. Doesn't matter. But I'm in this house, and the setup is we have a gas range, gas oven, a microwave not vented to the outside. So I'm telling the homeowner this story about gas ovens notorious for generating carbon monoxide. And she's looking at me like I got a third head. <laughs> okay? And she's thinking, what everybody's thinking is, if this was dangerous, why did they do it this way? Right? It was done this way, consequently it can't be dangerous, right? Because nobody ever builds a house improperly. So I'm looking at her and I'm like, I know she doesn't believe me. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, let me, let me illustrate it for you. Let's just do a, a demonstration. So I take my combustion analyzer, take the probe off of it, start it up, set it on top of her oven, or set it on top of her stove, okay? Turn on the oven. And we're standing there and we're having a conversation and we're talking and we're having a conversation. You know, about a minute and a half goes by because the idea was we were going to go away and then come back and look at where the reading was. Okay? So minute and a half. Anybody got an idea where the, the reading was? Guess. Okay, so, so at, okay, just ambient at 35, according to BPI, at 35 parts per million, you're supposed to evacuate the house. Okay? That's at 35. Where do you think it was? Give me a guess. Any guess? Okay. 50. 50. Do I hear, f do I hear 60? Anybody want to give me 60? There's 60. Do I get 70? 7. I got 70 over there. 80? Anybody for 80? I got 80. 90? 90? I got 90. How about 100? Anybody got 100? I got 100. Anybody got 200? Anybody got 200 over there? Anybody got 300? How about 400? Yeah. How about 500? Yeah. How about 600? Yeah. How about 800 parts per million? 800 parts per million. Okay, never mind, you know, we think about everybody's falling asleep at Thanksgiving. Never mind the tryptophan and the turkey. Okay, it's the oven that's kicking out 800 parts per million of carbon monoxide. She doesn't use her oven that often. Okay? It was a brand new house. She'd been there for probably two, three years. Okay? Well, it was fairly tight, right? Then we have electric ranges. Now, electric ranges don't have CAS. Combustion, it's not a combustion appliance. So there is no combustion appliance zone for an electric oven or range. A electric oven that is dirty will produce carbon monoxide. Let's move on to lights. Lights are fairly simple. CFL equals efficiency. A CFL will easily replace, not even just in energy or lack of energy use, but also in longevity, six, or I'm sorry, nine incandescent light bulbs. You go to the homeowner's house, and the homeowner says, you know what, I know LEDs are great, and as soon as my incandescents burn out, 
I'm going to replace them with CFLs. Mr. Homeowner, do you realize in the year that it's going to take for that incandescent bulb to burn out, how much are CFLs? Two bucks? Three bucks? Right? Let's talk about an expensive one. Let's talk about five bucks. Five bucks for a CFL. That's outrageous. Mr. Homeowner, do you realize that you could buy three bulbs with the money it's go you're going to spend burning that one incandescent light bulb? Okay. <laughs> so CFLs, 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 it makes sense to recycle your incandescent light bulbs and replace them with CFLs right now. You are going to save money hand over fist by doing that. Oh, you know, I don't like the light. It flickers. It takes some time. To, okay, then buy a $6 bulb. Okay? Don't buy the five, don't buy the $2 bulb. Buy the $6 bulb with the high quality um, with a that's that's fast start and and simulates sunlight and so on and so on, right? You know, I could buy a $15 CFL for every incandescent light in my house and make my money back in 12 months. Right? Okay? Right? So when you hear CFLs, 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 CFLs work. CFLs are a big deal. Now, people are concerned. The next question comes up is, isn't there mercury in a CFL light bulb? Yes, yes, there is. But the question is, how much? In a, in a uh, CFL light bulb, you'll find about five milligrams of mercury. How much is that? Well, your average home thermometer, you know, those mercury thermometers that you saw, the old style, there was 500 milligrams, so 100 times as much mercury in one of those, okay? And if you look at like a manual mercury thermostat, the the old thermostats that you see, not the digital ones, but the old ones, old school thermostats, those had 5,000, I'm sorry, 3,000 milligrams of mercury in them. So a CFL light bulb obviously doesn't even have close to as much mercury as some of the other things in our house. Okay, but you know, how do you handle these things? You know, how do you get rid of them? So when a CFL burns out, a CFL needs to be properly recycled, okay? And there's a couple of places you can go to find out how to recycle those. And then when we handle a CFL, of course, we don't want to be rough with a CFL. And of course, if we drop it, it's going to break. But, you know, if we break a CFL, should we evacuate our homes and go get our neighbors and call the EPA? No. Some people would want you to believe that, but that's not true. Okay, what you want to do to clean that up, first off, if you want to sweep it up as opposed to vacuuming it up. Sweep it up, put it in a plastic bag, a sealed plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag of some sort. Then we want to go with, a, find a disposable towel that's wet to get the, the shards and that powder and that stuff up. We don't want to disturb it too much. And then put that into our plastic bag. And then we want to go ahead and air out the house and then take that plastic bag to a recycling center and properly recycle it. The reality is a coal-fired power plant has to produce or spits 13.6 milligrams of mercury into the atmosphere in order to generate enough electricity to power a 60-watt incandescent light bulb for its life, as opposed to 3.3 milligrams for a CFL. So even with the mercury that's already in a CFL, we still put more mercury into the atmosphere with an incandescent light bulb than you would with a CFL.
LED, light emitting diode. These are really cool, okay? It's the new thing. It's, um, we've seen LED lighting for things like Christmas lights and such for a really long time. Um, then those LEDs started showing up in things like headlamps, high dollar headlamps. And then they started showing up in flashlights. And now we're actually starting to see LEDs show up in residential lighting um, in the form of light bulbs, okay? Before that, we saw them start to show up in automobiles, in tail lights, as decorative lights on, on automobiles, we saw that. Now, we're starting to see this LED lighting. We're actually starting to see in automobiles LED, uh, primary LED uh, headlamps, okay? So the LED technology is moving forward quite a bit, and it's, and it's really the result of what's called the super bright, the super bright LED, because LEDs weren't really all that bright. But with the advent of the super bright, we can now start to use LED lighting to do things that we normally would use a CFL for or would normally use an incandescent or halogen or um, something like that. Okay, so keep an eye on LED lighting. The challenge, though, still with LED lighting and its, and its barrier to mainstream use is going to be cost. It's still a very expensive way to light. They use a little bit less energy than a compact fluorescent. Each LED uses a little, just a little tiny bit of energy, right? But in order to generate enough light, you need an array, right? So if you look at this slide, you'll see a light bulb, but that's not one LED light. That's an array of LED lights. Another place that we see LED lights are in stoplights and traffic lights, okay? And what's nice about that is, again, we have an array of LED lights. And so as the LEDs burn out, you don't have to replace the traffic light right away because it takes time for enough of those LEDs to burn out so that you actually don't need, you have to actually have to replace the LED bulb, right? But when it comes to CFLs and dimming CFLs, a CFL is a fluorescent lamp, okay? Plain and simple. It's a fluorescent lamp and it has a ballast. And so you kind of make it into the right kind of form you need, and then it pops into the ballast, and the electronic ballast does all that control work. And unless you have a dimmable ballast, okay, you're, you can't, unless that is an actual dimmable CFL, you can't dim it, okay? You can try, and you'll get marginal success, but usually what you'll end up with is off, and or on, right? So you have a three-way switch or flickering. Yes, you have off, flickering, and on, right? So that's what you get with the three-way switch. Occupancy sensor. These you see a lot in commercial applications. You ever been in a public bathroom and you're doing your business and the light turns off on you and you, and you just have to kind of wave, okay? We have one of these in our room too. And what that occupancy sensor does is it senses when people are in the room and once uh, you know, it's got a timer on it, and once there's nobody in the room for whatever the period of time the timer is set for, then it shuts the lights down. And it also, you'll see that little switch down below, you also have an override. So you can actually still manually turn the lights on and off. So it works great in a public space. What does it sense? It's movement or uh, it's, it's heat. See, it's, it's, it's a heat signature. Okay. So it's not, like a, it's not like a security system motion detector that's detecting motion because, you know, in a room, you should be able to come into a room and sit there. The room is occupied. You're not moving. And the, the sensor will still detect that you're present. Um, so these are great if you've got teenagers or po folks in your house who just can't seem to turn the light off. They also work really well in rooms that you don't, aren't in very often. We talk about electronics. 
what percentage of a device's energy use is still happening when that device is in standby mode? Depends. But typically, if it's not an energy star, you're looking at 75% of the energy that that television, that monitor, your gaming console would use if it was on. So if you have a 200 watt television, that means that you're still using 150 watts all night long, all day long. You'll, you'll see this, right? So when it's on, it's got that green light, right? The green light, it's green, I'm on, okay? Then you put it in a standby mode and that green light turns to amber which means I'm still on, but just not quite as much. Why do you think television manufacturers developed standby mode? Because we live in the society of instant on. If you think about this, the telephone system, there's a rule on the telephone system. When your telephone is on hook, it's off, right? When you pick up the hook, your phone company has to turn your phone on and provide you with a dial tone in the time that it takes you to pick up the phone and get it to your ear. <coughs> okay? That's the rule. Now, once you dial the number, they can take a little bit more time to connect. But when you pick up that phone, they have to turn that phone on right now. And of course, when we watch TV, right, we want to sit down, our society at least, wants to sit down, hit the button, and they want to see a picture right now because we can't wait, right? Time is a ticket, right? We're on our way to our deathbed. We cannot wait another 10 seconds for that TV to come up, right? So that's what they did. They figured this out. They said, if we just turn the picture off, but we leave all the rest of the electronics hot and running, then when you hit that button and we come out of standby mode, I can give you a picture right now. Okay? So, we call these things ghost loads. Ghost loads, phantom loads, uh, vampire loads, goblin loads. No, not really. Okay? These are loads that happen, we're sucking power even when we're not on. You can, according to CNET, it can cost you anywhere from $30 to $230 a year in power just to watch television. That's just the cost of the power for the television, okay? Now let's add the cable box or the satellite box, okay? Because the satellite and the cable box. Oh, don't turn your satellite box off because then you'll lose all your programming. Okay? Go home tonight and look at your cable box, look at your satellite box. If it does not have an Energy Star logo on it, call your television provider and demand that they send you one. Because it will go off and it won't take your programming with you, with it. Okay? So your cable box, your satellite box should have an Energy Star logo on it. How do we go about managing these ghost loads, phantom loads, vampire loads? And let's start talking about power strips. Power strips work really great in a business environment because now you can plug in all of your monitors to a power strip and then at night you can shut the power strip off and you can take all those monitors that are in power save mode I believe it was actually Randy who told me the story. He went in, talked to a company, and they did that. They put all their monitors on power strips. I think they had somewhere between 10 and 12 computer monitors. Put them on power strips, shut them down every night. They saw a $50 reduction in their electric bill the following month. 50 bucks. That's a lot. And we're not talking about you know, a giant Fortune 500 company with thousands, if not tens of thousands of monitors. We're just talking about a small business, 10, 12 monitors, shutting those down every day, okay? 
So it works. But here's the problem, right? It's all about habit. Because usually this is what happens, right? You get to work. You uh, grab the coffee cup. Head off to get your coffee. Come back to work. Sit down your coffee. Sit down at the computer. You do that little thing with your mouse and you start working. Right? That's how it works. But... Now, if I got to turn the computer on, right? If I got to turn the computer on, I got to turn the, the monitor on. Then when I get back with my coffee, I got to sit there and wait for everything to come up. Not so, right? Because what's the first thing I did? I got to my desk and I grabbed my coffee cup and I went and I got coffee. Well, now all I have to do is when I get to my computer, I change my habit. I turn my computer on. I turn my monitor on. Then I grab my coffee cup and go get coffee. By the time I get back with my morning coffee, my computer's running, my monitor's running, I can sit down and start working, and I've just saved my company $50 this year. Now, a smart strip has a control outlet, and then it's got a series of slaved outlets or switched outlets. So, for example, let's say we have a stack of electronics. We've got a TV. We have a cable box. We have a DVD player. We have a pre-amplifier. We have an amplifier. We've got a number of other things that we use because, you know, we like entertainment in full HD, surround sound, everything. Okay? That's me. I like that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay? We're going to get entertained. Let's be entertained, right? Okay. Now... We can actually take, say, our preamplifier and plug it in as our master. And everything else is a slave. So we know that our preamplifier is not really going to be pulling that much electricity in a ghost load. So that's our master. So that out control outlet is always hot. When I pop on that preamplifier, the smart strip recognizes that I'm now pulling. Uh, wattage. I'm now pulling energy through the power strip. And it will then turn on the rest of the power for the last rest of the switched outlets. As a result, now I can turn on the television, I can turn on the DVD player, I can turn on all of the other things that I need in order to be entertained by my entertainment system. But it also prevents my television from pulling that 75%. It prevents prevents my cable box or my satellite box from pulling that 75%. Okay, keeps my gaming machine from pulling any extra power that it's not entitled to. One other thing that you want to take uh, notice of when it comes to things like ghost loads, vampire loads, phantom loads. Be very, very careful of wall warts. What do I mean by wall warts? The transformers that we use to power our phones, uh, recharge our cameras, and even power our laptops. Most of those things will still pull power even if you don't have anything plugged into it. The smart strip works where you have a master control and a and secondary switched outlets. If you plug it into your uh, into a switched outlet, then in order for it to have power, you'd have to have your primary appliance running. If you plugged it into at, to have it be the primary appliance, then it's going to pull power all the time. So a smart strip really isn't going to help you when it comes to things like phone chargers and battery chargers and those sorts of things. Okay? You need to you need to unplug them. Let's review. What appliances make up a home's energy base load? Refrigerator and our water heater. I heard somebody say hot water heater. Is it a hot water heater? It's a domestic water heater. Okay? Domestic hot water because we don't heat hot water, right? So it's not a hot water heater. <laughs> it's a water heater. What does MEF stand for? Modified energy factor, and what does it measure? 
the amount of clothes that can be both washed and dried per kilowatt hour. That's correct. So true or false? To conserve energy, the dryer vent should be routed into the thermal shell. Why? Creates moisture issues, and if we have a gas dryer, what happens? Carbon monoxide flows back in there. That's right. We vent our combustion gases into the house itself. If a homeowner uses their electronics, lighting, and appliances wisely and buys the most efficient technology when they upgrade, they will achieve the greatest efficiency and savings for their home.